Thank you for viewing my content. This channel is a result of over six years of hard research into understanding this crazy world we were all forced to live. I give no legal advice, just information. History, law, geopolitics, philosophy, religion, and much more are discussed herein. I expose how the aristocracy use their financial and commercial system to run the world behind the scenes. It is knowledge that creates a sense of responsibility, and it is my responsibility to speak the truth as I understand it, and spread this knowledge as far and as wide as possible. I encourage everyone to do their duty in resisting the new world order as they see fit. I do not monetize my content, but if you find my research to be helpful, please check out the description for contact and donation information. Thank you, and now to the topic at hand. All right, today we're talking about uh, the famous uh, Committee of 300 book by the author, Dr. John Coleman. Uh, I've read this book. I've read a couple of different other uh, John Coleman's books. It's uh, a classic uh, globalist book and uh, important information in it. I don't agree with everything that he, all of his conclusions, but nevertheless, a uh, very good book to add to your library and to read. Um, here's some other books by him. Check this out on Amazon. Uh, you got Freemasonry from A to Z, Illuminati in America, um, Diplomacy by Deception. Wrote a book about the Rothschild dynasty, a history of them. He's got a lot of other stuff. Uh, if you come over here to archive.org, there's a whole section. Uh, devoted to him is called the John Coleman Ultimate Collection. Check that out, and uh, you can download all these all these uh, books here for free. Just uh, click on them and download the PDF or whatever suits your uh, reading needs. But uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today: Committee of Three Hundred by Dr. John Coleman. This is a video concerning the conspiracy globalist book called The Committee of 300 by Dr. John Coleman. The book exposes an ultra-secretive group of roughly 300 families that he says rules the world. He identifies them, accurately in my mind, as the black nobility. Dr. Coleman claims he worked for British intelligence for most of his career, and this gives us the impression that he's speaking from an insider perspective. In the foreword of his book, he says, quote, In my career as a professional intelligence officer, I had many occasions to access highly classified documents, but during service as a political science officer in the field in Angola, West Africa, I had the opportunity to view a series of top-secret classified documents which were unusually explicit. What I saw filled me with anger and resentment and launched me on a course from which I have not deviated namely to uncover what power it is that controls and manages the British and United States governments. This book is full of names of people and organizations and secret societies, and I will get to some of that in the presentation. However, I can't cover them all, for that would make this presentation way too long. On page 152, Dr. Coleman gives us an idea of who we are talking about when we reference the name The Committee of 300. Quote, included in the membership are the old families of the European black nobility, the American Eastern establishment, in Freemason hierarchy and the Order of Skull and Bones, the Illuminati, or as it is known by the committee, Moriah Conquering Wind, the Muma Group, the National and World Council of Churches, the Circle of Initiates, the Nine Unknown Men, Lucis Trust, Jesuit Liberation Theologists, the Order of the Elders of Zion, the Nazi Princes, International Monetary Fund, the Bank of International Settlements, the United Nations, the Central, British Couture Coranti, Italian P2 Masonry, especially those in the Vatican Hierarchy, the Central Intelligence Agency, Tavistock Institute Selected Personnel, various members of leading foundations and insurance companies named in the lists that follow, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, the Milner Group Roundtable, Sini Foundation, German Marshall Fund, Ditchley Foundation, NATO, Club of Rome, Environmentalists, 
the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, One World Government Church, Socialist International, Black Order, Thule Society, Anand Herb Rosicrucianists, the Great Superius Ones, and literally hundreds of other organizations, unquote. If we want to know the goals of this Committee of 300, we should just start reading the list on page 23 provided by Dr. Coleman. Quote, What are the goals of the secret elite group, the inheritors of Illuminism, Moriah conquering wind, the cult of Dionysus, the cult of Isis, Catharism, Bogomilism, the elite group that also calls itself the Olympians. They truly believe they are equal in power and stature to the legendary gods of Olympus who have, like Lucifer their god, set themselves about our true god. Absolutely believe they have been charged with implementing the following divine right. Number one, a one world government, new world order with a unified church and monetary system under their direction. Number two, the utter destruction of all national identity and national pride. Number three, the destruction of religion and more especially the Christian religion, with one exception, their own creation mentioned above. Number four, control of each and every person through means of mind control and what Brzezinski called technotronics, which create human-like robots and a system of terror besides which Felix Drzezinski's red terror will look like children at play. Number five, an end to all industrialization and the production of nuclear-generated electric power in what they call the post-industrial zero-growth society. Exempted are the computer and service industries. United States industries that remain will be exported to countries such as Mexico where abundant slave labor is available. Unemployables in the wake of industrial destruction will either become opium, heroin, heroin or cocaine addicts or become statistics in the elimination process we know today as Global 2000, Agenda 21, or 2030. Legalization of drugs and pornography. Number seven, depopulation of large cities according to the trial run carried out by Pol Pot regime in Cam Cambodia. It is interesting to note that Pol Pot's genocidal plans were drawn up here in the United States by one of the Club of Rome's research foundations. Number eight, Suppression of all scientific development except for those deemed beneficial by the committee, especially targeted as nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. Particularly hated are the fusion experiments presently being scorned and ridiculed by the committee and its jackals of the press. Development of the fusion torch would blow the committee's conception of limited natural resources right out of the window. A fusion torch properly used could create unlimited untapped natural resources for the most ordinary substances. Number nine, caused by means of limited wars in the advanced countries and by means of starvation and diseases in third world countries. The death of three billion people by the year 2000, people they call useless eaters. A committee of 300 commissioned Cyrus Vance to write a paper on the subject of how best to bring about such genocide. The paper was produced under the title The Global 2000 Report and was accepted and approved for action by President Carter for and on behalf of the U.S. government, and accepted by Edwin Muskie, uh, the Secretary of State. Under the terms of the Global 2000 Report, the population of the United States is to be reduced by 100 million by the year 2050. Number 10. To weaken the moral fiber of the nation and to demoralize workers in the labor class by creating mass unemployment, as jobs dwindle due to the post-industrial zero-growth policies introduced by the Club of Rome, Demoralized and discouraged workers will resort to alcohol and drugs. The youth of the land will be encouraged by means of rock music and drugs to rebel against the status quo, thus undermining and eventually destroying the family unit. In this regard, the Committee of 300 commissioned Tavistock Institute to prepare a blueprint as to how this could best be achieved. Tavistock directed Stanford Research to undertake the work under the direct direction of Professor Willis Harmon. This work later became known as the Aquarian Conspiracy. Number 11. To keep people everywhere from deciding their own destinies by means of one created crisis after another and then managing such crises. This will confuse and demoralize the population to the extent where f faced with too many choices, apathy on a massive scale will result. In the case of the United States, 
an agency for crisis management, is already in place. It is called the Federal Emergency Management a Agency, or more commonly known as FEMA. Number 12. To introduce new cults and continue to boost those already functioning, which includes rock music gangsters, such as the filthy, degenerate Mick Jagger's Rolling Stones, a gangster group much favored by European black nobility, and all of the Tavistock-created groups which began with the Beatles. To continue to build up the cult of Christian fundamentalism, begun by the British East India Company's servant, Darby, which will be misused to strengthen the Zionist state of Israel through identifying with the Jews, through the myth of God's chosen people, and by donating very substantial amounts of money to what they mistakenly believe is a religious cause in the furtherance of Christianity. Number 13. To press for the spread of religious cults such as the Muslim Brotherhood, Muslim fun Fundamentalism, Sikhs, and to carry out experiments of the Jim Jones and Son of Sam type of murders. It is worth noting that the late Ayatollah Khomeini was a creation of British Intelligence Mil Military Intelligence Division 6, commonly, knows at, commonly known as MI6, as reported in my 1985 work, What Really Happened in Iran. Number 14. To export religious liberation ideas around the world so as to undermine all existing religious, but more especially, the Christian religion. This began with the Jesuit liberation theology which brought about the downfall of the Somoza family rule in Nicaragua and which is today destroying El Salvador, now 25 years into a civil war, Costa Rica, and Honduras. Number 15. To cause total collapse of the world's economies and engender total political chaos. Number 16. To take control of all foreign and domestic policies of the United States. Number 17. To give the fullest support to supranational institutions such as the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the Bank of International Settlements, the World Court, and as far as possible, make local institutions of lesser effect by gradually phasing them out or bringing them under the mantle of the United Nations. Number 18. Penetrate and subvert all governments and work from within them to destroy the sovereign integrity of nations represented by them. Number 19. Organize a worldwide terrorist apparatus and negotiate with terrorists whenever terrorist activities take place. Number 20. Take control of education in America with the intent and purpose of utterly and completely destroying it. So that is the end of the list. And it's the same old tired communist plan of destruction of the power of the people by destroying our ability to make wealth. Socialism is a failure. Uh, speaking of H.G. Wells, another globalist writer, Coleman says on page 154, quote, There will be no middle class, only rulers and servants. All laws will be uniform under a legal system of world courts, practicing the same unified code of laws, backed up by a one-world government police force and a one-world unified military to enforce laws in all former countries where no national boundaries shall exist. Hmm, that sounds like the UCC. The system will be on the basis of a welfare state. Those who are obedient and subservient to the one world government will be rewarded with the means to live. Those who are rebellious will simply be starved to death or be declared outlaws, thus a target for anyone who wishes to kill them. Privately owned firearms or weapons of any kind will be prohibited." Unquote. So the overall thrust of this book has to do with mind control, culture creation, and subversion. Coleman shows us how this interlocking group of institutions and people work together on both sides of the political spectrum to make public opinion, and how about we are up against an enemy that has totally infiltrated our world. He states on page 31, quote, As I have so often stated, we have been misled into believing that the problem I am talking about has its origins in Moscow. We have been brainwashed into believing that communism is the greatest danger we Americans are facing. Uh, but he's referring to the Cold, Cold War in that period when uh, Russia was the biggest enemy, and they're doing the same exact thing today with Trump. This is simply not so. The greatest danger arises from the mass of traitors in our midst. Our Constitution warns us to be watchful of the enemy within our gates. These enemies are the servants of the Committee of 300 who occupy high positions within our gov governmental structure. The United States is where we must begin our fight to turn back the tide threatening to engulf us. 
and where we must meet and defeat those internal conspirators." Unquote. This book was published in 1992, just after the Reagan presidency, and Dr. Coleman shows that his so-called conservative presidency was in fact full of Fabian socialists. On page 34, quote, Committee of 300, through its many affiliated organizations, was able to nullify the Reagan presidency. Here's what Stuart Butler of the Heritage Foundation had to say on the subject. Quote, the, right thought it, the right thought it had won in 1980, but in fact it had lost. Unquote. What Butler was referring to was the situation in which the right found itself when it realized that every single position of importance in the Reagan administration was filled by Fabianists appointees recommended by the Heritage Foundation. Butler went on to say that Heritage would use right-wing ideas to impose left-wing radical principles upon the United States. The same radical ideas which Sir Peter Vickers Hall, top Fabianist in the U.S. and the number one man at Heritage, had been openly discussing during the election year, unquote. So as per usual, there is a Hegelian dialectic going on in this situation. We must remember that all of politics is no different. They may say that they are liberal, liberal or conservative or a socialist or a fiscal conservative. But well, what they really are is a bunch of lying, thieving scumbags who love to deceive us into giving up our God-given rights and sell ourselves into slavery for their corporate New World Order. One of, if not the most powerful tool that New World Order has is mind control and the ability to appeal to humans' natural inclination to have herd mentality, to manufacture a population who doesn't even care if they get assaulted every day in every way. Dr. Coleman mentions who in his eyes were the four most influential in the science. On page 146 he says, Apart from John Rawlings Reese, no two men made such difference to world politics and world events as shaped as Tavistock than Edward Bernays, the double nephew, the double nephew of Sigmund Freud, and Kurt Lewin. A third man must be included here, although he was never on the faculty at Tavistock. And I refer to Willie Moonsberg, whose propaganda methods and applications so, so crucial to the modern age of mass communication earn him the title, the greatest propagandist in the world. Undoubtedly the most brilliant man of his era, he began his work before World War I. Moonsberg was responsible for sanitizing the Bolsheviks after they overthrew the Romanov dynasty. John Rawlings Reese was born in about 1890. Uh, his occupations were, include the director of Tavistock Clinic, and the president of the World Federation for Mental Health. He wrote some notable works, Health of the Mind, The Shaping of Psychiatry by War, Modern Practice in Psychological Medicine, um, Interwar Work at the Tavistock Institute, um, let's see, Reese took on, Reese was one of the key figures at the original Tavistock Clinic and became its medical director from 1933, and he began to make plans to establish an institute of medical psychology with beds and more opportunities to train people in psychi psychiatric methods, and brought a site in, uh, I'm sorry, bought a site in Bloomsbury to build it, but his plans, plans were halted by the outbreak of World War II. Okay, then he went to World War II, and in 1941, a group of psychiatrists at the Tavistock Institute saw that the right questions were asked in Parliament in order to secure the means to train new measures. As a result, they were asked to join the Directorate of Army Psychiatry and did so as a group. Uh, so this guy was, you know, this guy, he, he was English, and he was uh, in contact with... Rudolf Hess and the Nazis through his work at Tavistock, so that uh, that says a lot. And then, of course, he went to work on Operation Phoenix, more mind control, um, and then he went on to become the president of the World Federation for Mental Health. So this guy was very, very important and very influential. The, the World Federation for Mental Health was founded, and Reese was elected as the first president. This organization is now a non-governmental organization, former consultative status at the United Nations. Okay. 
So this this dude is incredibly uh, connected, and this is who uh, Coleman considers to be one of the most influential people on the whole MK Ultra uh, mind control. Another key player was Edward Bernays, who was credited by Coleman as the forefather of modern propaganda. From his Wikipedia page, quote, of his many books, Crystallizing Public Opinion, 1923, and Propaganda, 1928, gained special attention as early efforts to define and theorize the field of public relation. Citing works of writers such as Gustav Liban, Wilfred Lippmann, and his own double uncle, Sigmund Freud, he described the masses as irrational and subject to herd instinct, and outlined how skilled practitioners could use crowd psychological, or right, psychology and psycho psychoanalysis to control them in desirable ways, unquote. Kurt Lewin. The third man Dr. Coleman mentions is Kurt Lewin. This is from Wikipedia as well. Quote, Lewin was a German-American psychologist known as one of the modern pioneers of social, organizational, and applied psychology in the United States. When Hitler came to power in 1933, Lewin moved to England and then America. In that year, he met Eric Trist of the London Tavistock Clinic. Trist was impressed with his theories and went on to use them in his studies, unquote. Quote, Lewin tried to come up with the, way, with the way identity was constructed from standpoint and perspectives. These were the beginnings of what ended up developing into groupthink. Lewin started to become quite interested in how ideas were created and, perpe and then perpetuated by the mentality of a group, unquote. Historically, drugs have been pushed on a nations that couldn't be beat militarily, such as China, in order to chip away at the moral and societal fabric that holds everything together. Today in America, we have a drug, we have drug ec epidemics of all different kinds, from heroin to cocaine to drugs even worse like meth and all kinds of pharmaceuticals. These drugs rot our society from within and make us weaker and more susceptible to an outside force directing our lives. Coleman also talks about the use of drugs to make the people complacent with their miserable situation on pages 137 to 138. Quote, Now let us consider another type of drug still undiscovered, but probably just around the corner, a drug making people happy in situations where they would normally feel miserable. Is there anyone more miserable than a person who has sought and been able, unable to find work? Such a drug would be a blessing but a blessing fraught with grave social and political dangers. By making a harmless chemical euphoria freely available, a dictator can reconcile entire population to a state of affairs to which self-respecting human beings ought not to be reconciled." Unquote. This is a work that Coleman cites in his book, Committee of 300. It's called The Imperial Drug Trade by Joshua Roundtree. Um, it was, it was uh, published in... 1906, the second edition. Um, you can find this uh, book on archive.org, and I'll link to it in the description. But it goes through the history of the drug trade, uh, the British drug trade, and the East India Company, and um, all these other uh, things, because drugs have been historically a very important part of the way that these people control everything. We see how they do everything with uh, pharmaceuticals nowadays. Uh, so I just thought this would be interesting to include. It's called the Imperial Drug Trade. Check it out. In my book, The Committee of 300, which took 20 years of research, and incidentally, I was only a little bit behind with Karl Marx. He spent 30 years in the British Museum in London where he got most of his things from. I point out that the British East India Company was the most powerful trading company in the world. They made their massive monies out of the dope trade. They first grew prime poppies in Kew Gardens in Kensington, London, got the best producing opium poppies. They then shipped them to Benares in India where they began a massive plantation of poppies, opium producing poppies. They then used their famous tea clippers to transport the poppies in the form of raw opium to China. And by their military force, they imposed an opium policy on China that turned the Chinese nation into a nation of addicts. They even want to have this chemical high readily available for people who they foresee to be unemployed with no purpose in their life. On page 138, Coleman says, 
Quote, in one of the Royal Institute of International Affairs top secret papers, the scenario is laid out as followed, in part, Having been failed by Christianity and with unemployment on every hand, those who have been without jobs for five years or more will turn away from the church and seek solace in drugs. That is when full control of the drug trade must be completed in order that the government of all countries who are under our jurisdiction will have a monopoly which we will control through supply. Drug bars will take care of the unruly and the discontent. Would-be revolutionaries will be turned into harmless addicts with no will of their own, unquote. On page 155, he continues, quote, Pornography shall be promoted and be compulsory, showing in every theater of cinema, including homosexual and lesbian pornography. The use of recreation, recreational drugs shall be compulsory, with each person allotted drug quotas, which can be purchased at a one-world government store th stores throughout the world. Mind control drugs will be expanded and usage become compulsory. Such mind control drugs shall be given in food and or water supplies without the knowledge and or consent of the people. Drug bars shall be set up, run by one world government employees where the slave class shall be able to spend their free time. In this manner, the non-elite masses will be reduced to the level and behavior of controlled animals with no will of their own and easily regimented and controlled." Unquote. So this is all stuff we heard from Bertrand Russell and his The Impact of Science on Society. All these globalists parrot the same exact message. Very few of the ideas are usually their own. Television and computer screens everywhere at all times has been one of the most influential phenomena affecting the first world, and especially America today. If you have the misfortune to have to go into a sports bar, you will see and smell all of the distraction and poison that people live for today. Sometimes up to three or four screens everywhere you look. And all of this keeps people confused, entertained, numb, and hypnotized. It's a big news of Brinsky in his book, Between Two Ages, talks about how the new Tektronic era will bring people into a hive mind consciousness. This, of course, will make people much easier to control. Control the mind, control the body. On page 28, talking of Brzezinski, Coleman says this, quote, Brzezinski went on to say, that our society is not in an information revolution based on amusement focus, spectator spectacles, saturation coverage by television of sporting events, which provide an opiate for an increasingly purposeless mass." Unquote. Was Brzezinski another seer and a prophet? Could he see into the future? The answer is no. What he wrote in his book was simply copied from the Committee of 300's blueprint given to the Club of Rome for ex execution. Isn't it true that by 1991, we already have a purposeless mass of citizens? Who could say that 30 million unemployed and 4 million homeless people are a purpose, purposeless mass, or at least the nucleus of one?" Unquote. These men who work out these ideas do so for the ruling class, for the ruling class, so as to create better and more efficient ways by which to pacify, control, and lead the masses. The Tavistock Institute is one of the most influential forces swaying public opinion and setting up every possible dialectic in order to keep we the people confused, divided, and conquered. It's important for us to remember that the entertainment that we consume on a regular basis is of this very nature. It's not the most popular TV show, news agency, newspaper, or movie only because of its entertainment value. It also has a large social programming and propaganda agenda within it as well. Control the mind control the body. Coleman says on page 158, quote, all information services and print media shall be under the control of the one world government. Regular brainwashing control measures shall be passed off as entertainment in the matter in which it was practiced and became fine art in the United States. Youths removed from disloyal parents shall receive special education designed to brutalize them. Youths of both sexes shall re receive training to qualify as prison guards for the one world labor camp system." Unquote. This reminds me of a famous David Rockefeller quote that was leaked from a 1991 Bilderberg meeting. Quote, we are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and under the other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop 
our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march toward a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to national auto-determination practiced. Unquote. The Royal Institute for International Affairs, or the RIIA, also known as Chatham House, was created in 1919 by the Bankster Thieves and Elite as a think tank for the New World Order. From Wikipedia, quote, in the Uni University of Pennsylvania's rankings announced in January 2017 for their global Go Think uh, Go To Think Tank report, Chatham House was ranked the think tank of the year and the second most influential in the world after the Brookings Institute, unquote, a think tank of the exact same nature. These think tanks are very important to the elite for the purpose of shaping public opinion on both sides of the political spectrum. Institutes and think tanks on both sides serve the purposes of the NWO in one way, shape, or form. Carol Quigley tells us a bit about the RR, RIIA and its sister corporations on page 132 of his Tragedy and Hope. Quote, In 1909 to 1913, they organized semi-secret groups known as roundtable groups. In 1919, they founded the Royal Institute for International Affairs, Chatham House. Similar institutions for international affairs were established in the chief British dominions and in the United States, where it is known as the Council on Foreign Relations, unquote. There are many other societies that are operating for the RIIA. The Illuminati, which has been around for many, many years, I've written a work called The Illuminati in America, 1784 to 1994. A lot of people think this is an ancient secret society that's gone away. They think that Adam Weishaupt had a quarrel with the Catholic Church and that's it. Don't you believe it? 13 of the top families in the United States are in the Illuminati today and they have a big say on everything that happens politically in this country. Then we have the Society of Cincinnati, which I don't think many of you will have heard about. That is an ultra, ultra secret society to which every president of the United States is forced to belong including our so-called conservative presidents. And I point this out to you to show you that it doesn't matter who is in the White House. This committee of 300, through the Royal Institute for International Affairs, through the Council on Foreign Relations, exercise, exercises complete control. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. Thank you very much, um, Richard, and I am delighted to be here in these new headquarters. Um, I have been often to, uh, I guess, the mothership in New York City, uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. We have further challenging issues to address between now and 2015, including how to take account of countries' common but differentiated responsibilities for tackling climate change. By moving towards a spectrum of commitments that reflects the economic realities of the 21st century, the current binary divide between developing and developed countries was defined in 1990, and I believe it's time to move on from it. But the fact is, all of our legislation is drafted by people who have been through the Tavistock Institute process. <laughs> and um, one of the important groups which handles all this is called the Institute for Policy Studies. Now we have a um, chart. This book was written by James Tyson, Target America, The, uh, the Influence of Communist Propaganda on U.S. Media, uh, published in 1981. He has here the table of organization of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union and its uh, agents in the United States. And it lists, of course, the National Lawyers Guild, Communist Party USA, 
and the Institute for Policy Studies. Another important think tank talked about in the book on page 199 is the Institute for Policy Studies. Quote, The entire spectrum of the new left in the United States was the work of British intelligence MI6 acting through roundtable assets and the Institute for Policy Studies, just as it did with all countries with a Republican base, whose policies had to be changed. LPS played a leading role, even as it does today in South Africa and South Korea. I'm sorry, that was IPS. Much of IPS's activities are explained in my work, IPS Revisited, published in 1990. IPS had one main function, that being to sow discord and spread disinformation, resulting in chaos. One such program aimed at America's youth, centered on drugs. Through a series of IPS fronts, acts like the stoning of Nixon's motorcade and large numbers of bombings, a climate of deception was effectively created, which led a majority of Americans to believe that the United States was under threat from the KGB, the GRU, and the Cuban DGI. The world went out. The word went out that a lot of these imaginary agents had close ties to the Democrats through George McGovern. It was, in fact, a model disinformation campaign for which MI6 is justly famous. Unquote. Concerning the famous roundtable group in British politics, Carol Quigley in his Tragedy and Hope on page 40, 471 states, quote, Until 1915, the two parties represented the same social class, the small group known as society. In fact, both parties, conservative and liberals, were controlled from at least 1866 by the same small clique of society. This clique consisted of no more than half a dozen cheap families, their relatives and allies, reinforced by an occasional recruit from outside. These recruits were generally obtained from the select educational system of society. Going to page 472, quote, at the beginning of the 20th century, the inner clique of the conservative party was made up almost completely of the Cecil family and their relatives, unquote. And on page five, uh, 581, the round table group later became the Cliveden set. It dominated the Royal Institute of International Affairs called Chatham House, unquote. On page 145, Coleman says, quote, the round table was established in South Africa by Cecil Rhodes and funded by the English Rothschild family. Its, pur its purpose was to train business leaders royal, loyal to the British crown who would secure the vast gold and diamond treasures for the British crown. South Africans had their birthright stolen from them in a coup so massive and all-pervading that, so that it was apparent only a central unified command could have pulled it off. That unified command was the Committee of 300, unquote. Coleman states on page 146 of the Committee of 300, quote, it was Green, the son of a Christian evangelical cleric who spawned Rhodes, Milner, John Wheeler Bennett, A.D. Lindsay, George Bernard, Bernard Shaw, and Hijalmer Schott, Hitler's finance minister. I'm sure I said that wrong. I pause here to remind readers that the round table is only one sector of this vast and all-encompassing committee of 300. Yet the round table itself consists of a maze of companies, institutions, banks, and educational establishments, which in itself would take qualified insurance actuaries a year to sort out. Unquote. Another group that Coleman refers to in the book are the Bulletburgers. This group has been the center of much controversy over the last decade or so, with authors, reporters, and researchers following them all across the world to attempt to sneak into their highly secretive and highly guarded meetings. On page 147 he says, quote, Some of the spin-offs of the round table are the Bilderbergers, set up and run by Duncan Sandys, a prominent politician and son-in-law of the late Winston Churchill. The Ditchley Foundation, a secret bankers club, which I exposed in my 1983 work, International Bankers Conspiracy, the Ditchley Foundation. The Trilateral Commission, the Atlantic Council, or the United States, and the Aspen Institute for hum Humanistic Studies, whose well-hidden behind-the-scenes founder was Lord Bullock of the Royal Institute for International Affairs, for whom Robert Anderson fronted, unquote. The Club of Rome is one of the most insidious 
baneful organizations in existence today, which has done intolerable, immeasurable harm to the United States of America. This committee of 300 told a man called Aurelio Pecky to form this club of Rome with the main object of bringing down the industries and the agricultural development of the United States. He immediately wrote a paper in which he said there are too many people on the earth and that the United States with its industrial development, its agricultural re development is responsible for this curse of overpopulation. And he picked up the documentation for his work from Lord Bertrand Russell, a senior statesman of the Committee of 300. And Lord Bertrand Russell had written a work called The Impact of Science on Society. And if you can ever secure a copy of that book, which I doubt you'll be able to get, you will see in there that he said, the world is grossly overpopulated and we have to get rid of at least half of the world's population and it doesn't matter how we do it. So the Club of Rome was instituted and organized to start an attack on the world's population using the United States as the whipping boy. And they came up with a paper called the Zero Growth Post-Industrial Plan for Industry and Agriculture for the United States of America. Three days after that plan was accepted as official United States policy by James Earl Carter, I was able to, through my intelligence people, get a copy of this insidious document. Basically what it said was that the middle class in the United States of America had to be destroyed because in the coming push to a world order, the middle class would be the stumbling block because history had shown that the peasant class in ancient days when they had revolted were just easily crushed. crushed. There was no resistance but now had grown a new super class of people in the United States called the middle class. One of the most important groups, according to Coleman, is called the Club of Rome, an organization put together by various elites in order to curb industrialization. The website says, quote, The Club of Rome is an organization of individuals who share a common concern for the future of humanity and strive to make a difference. Our members are notable scientists, economists, businessmen, and businesswomen, high-level civil servants, and former heads of state from all around the world. Our mission is to promote understanding of the global changes, of challenges facing humanity, and to propose solutions through scientific analysis, communication, and advocacy, unquote. Sounds nice, right? Well, Dr. Coleman doesn't think so. He sees the Club of Rome for what they are, a communist organization bent on destroying the prosperity of the first world. Called Stuart Chase, an arch-Fabian socialist, wrote a book called A New Deal. Frances Perkins, who was the first female socialist cabinet minister appointed in the United States in the Roosevelt administration, she got hold of a copy of this book and she ran to Roosevelt and said, look, this would be a marvelous program for you. So in the 1932 Democrat Cong and by the way, don't call them the Democratic Party because they are not. We are a confederated republic we are a constitutional republic. In a confederated constitutional republic, you cannot have a democratic party. You can have a democrat party, and that's what we should start calling them. But she ran up, and Roosevelt was so enamored with this deal that in 1932, they hastily changed their platform, and he came out and announced his new deal which is a verbatim, word-for-word -word program taken from Stuart Chase's book, Socialism, A New Deal. Socialism is a failure, and we have creeping socialism in this country today which has nowhere to go but to communism in the new world order, one world government. That is the direction that William Jefferson Clinton is pushing this country as hard as he can go.
and GATT is an in integral part of that. The socialist policies of England failed miserably. They got the great Professor Harold Lasky of the London School of Economics. From Wikipedia, quote, the Club of Rome was founded in April 1986 by Aurelio P uh, Pessi, an Italian industrialist, and Alexander King, a Scottish scientist. It was formed when a small international group of people from the fields of academia, civil society, diplomacy, and industry met at Villa Farnesia in Rome, hence the name. The Club of Rome stimulated considerable public attention with the first report to the club, The Limits to Growth. Published in 1972, its computer simulation suggest, suggested that economic growth could not continue indefinitely because of resource depletion. The 1973 oil crisis increased public concern about this problem. The report went on to sell 30 million copies in more than 20 languages, making it the best-selling environmental book in history." Unquote. In 1991, the club published The First Global Revolution, asking the world to look in the mirror if they want to know what's wrong with the world, especially the environment. The report says, quote, New enemies have to be identified, new strategies imagined, and new weapons devised. In searching for a common enemy against whom we can unite, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the bill. In their totality, and their interactions, these phenomena do constitute a common threat which must be confronted by everyone together. But in designating these dangers as the enemy, we fall into the trap, which we have already warned readers about, namely mistaking symptoms for causes. All these dangers are caused by human intervention in natural processes, and it is only through ch changed attitudes and behavior that they can be overcome. The real enemy is humanity itself." Unquote. What a scandalous thing that our government is fully cooperating with this organization built up by the Royal Institute for International Affairs to destroy the middle class of the United States and to add to the policies of global genocide. And that brings me to the next question. What is the Global 2000? Once again, when I heard about this policy, it was three days after it had been accepted by the United States government as its official policy. And the Global 2000 was a blueprint for mass genocide produced by the Club of Rome. Basically, what the Global 2000 calls for is the destruction of half of the world's population by the year 2050, hence the title 2000. They built a case based on Bertrand Russell and H.G. Wells' findings that the world was going to be overpopulated, would be a terrible place to live in. That was picked up by a fellow called J uh, uh, Robert Strange McNamara, and a stranger individual you're not likely to meet in this world. And this man had a conference of all the leading bankers about 12 years ago, and he said the biggest menace facing the world today is the American middle class and overpopulation. He linked the two together. And he said, by the year 2050, this is the state of the world. All of these unfed, unwashed people, no jobs. He said, do we want to live in a world like that? So the global 2000 was a genocidal plan to take care of the people of the United States who don't have any jobs and who, like Alexander King said, are never going to get their jobs back. Dr. Rome, uh, Coleman wrote a book called the, Qu the Club of Rome, and it's full of information about the specific group who, whom he believes has a lot of power. It's clear that the reports and information they presented in the 70s is what started the revolutionary environmental movement that so many socialist progressives parrot on a daily basis on social media and the like. Most people I know personally are completely brainwashed into believing global warming is real and that the governments need to institute redistrib redistributionist policies in order to fix the problem. Coleman identifies hard left and socialist ideas as being very destructive throughout his work. By our enemies, the socialists, the Marxists, the liberals, the so-called progressives, socialism is a failure. Even though the propagandists are very clever in draping their miserable ideas in the finest hues, 
doesn't change the fact that socialism is slavery. When referring to the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions on page 57, he says, quote, Purpose, to spread ideas that will bring on social reforms of the liberal kind with dem democracy as an ideology. One of its activities is to draw a new constitution for the U.S. which will be strongly monarchical and socialist socialistic as found in Denmark. The center is an Olympian stronghold. Located in Santa Barbara, it is housed in what is affectionately called the, the Parthenon. Former Representative John Rarick called it an outfit loaded with communists. By 1873, work on a new United States Constitution was in its 35th draft, which proposes an amendment guaranteeing environmental rights, the thrust of which is to reduce the industrial base of the, the United States to a mere whisper of what it was in 1969. In other words, this institution is carrying out Club of Rome's zero-growth policy, uh, industrial policies laid down by the Committee of 300, unquote. The network of groups is basically endless. It would take years just to name all of them and their connections with each other. As a matter of fact, Coleman takes a few pages to list them, organizations such as League of Industrial Democracy, Freedom House, Committee for a Democratic Majority, Foreign Policy Research Institute, Social Democrats USA, Institute for Social Relations, the Citizens League, War Resisters League, the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, of the Institute for Democratic Socialism, Anti-Defamation -Def League Fact-Finding Division, International Association of Machinists, Amalgamated Clothing Workers, A. Philip Randolph Institute, Cambridge Policy Studies Institute, Economic Committee of the North Atlantic Institute, Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, Harvard Psychological Clinic, Institute for Social Research Science, or, I'm sorry, Institute for Social Research, Science Policy Research Institute, Systems Development Corporation, the Mont Perlin Society, Hoover Institution, Heritage Foundation, Human Resource Research Office, Research Analysis Corporation, and many, many others. So we can see that uh, most of these institutions are of a left wing bent, and, uh, you know, I. Uh, Coleman's very clear about that, that it's not conservative values that are the enemy, it's uh, liberal values that are the enemy. And they started this beverage plan, which is the basis of our socialist social security plan. Note I said socialist social security plan. That's how we got it. It was co-opted directly from the beverage plan, very eagerly embraced by Roosevelt. Socialism is a failure. So we've seen how these groups are incredibly influential in creating public opinion and even controlling the cabinets of entire presidencies. Coleman makes it clear on page 154 that voting is a farce. Quote, Our election has become a farce thanks to the work done by Tavistock in controlling the thoughts and ideas of the people of this nation by means of inner directional conditioning and long-distance long pen uh, penetration of which the mind control science of polling is an integral part. Tavistock serves the black nobility in all its elements, working to rob us of the victory of the American Revolution of 1776. If the reader is unfamiliar with the black nobility, of course, the term does not refer to black people. It refers to a group of extremely wealthy people, dynasties, whose history states, dates back far more than 500 years and who make up the backbone of the Committee of 300, unquote. The Venetian black nobility. Now, why are they called the black nobility? They called that because of the vileness and the evilness of their deeds. These families date back to the 11th centuries, the Locatis, the Reconatis. They were called, and the Guelphs, by the way, I'll come to them, they're particularly interesting. They were called that because of the evilness of their deeds. They make Lucrezia Borgia look like a Sunday school teacher. They had so much money, which is the outcome of the drug trade, the years of investing, the years of gaining control of every min mining, mineral, gold, oil, natural resource of the world, that they can afford to finance these things. So the black nobility are the ancient 
aristocrats of Venice and Genoa. And they called that because of the nature of their deeds. The Black Gelfs were one of the worst of them. Now, interesting enough, the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth II, is a Gelf. She is not a Windsor. This was a title that was evolved in 1935 by her father to put researchers off the track. Uh, I like to include myself in that category, although I wasn't doing it then. I was much too young to be doing it, but he didn't like that certain people were getting hot on the track of who this royal family actually was. And so this was put out that they are the House of Windsor. They are not. They are the House of Guelph. And it's important for us to know that because every time there's a financial crisis, it follows a meeting of the Black Guelphs upon the Royal Britannia yacht of the Queen of England, which anchors off the coast of Venice. And all the world bankers meet over there and say, now this is what we're going to do to country X. This is how we're going to control this worldwide situation. And then they go off and give their orders to everybody. So that is the way it is done. I believe that elections, especially modern, are trauma-based mind control. It was easy to see with the 2016 election, election cycle between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. The population is hit with fear-mongering and low vibrational drama. By the time the election is over, the people are tired and beaten down, and the morale as a whole suffers. This trauma gets us used to being abused, and as the government becomes more powerful and total totalitarian, they will attempt to abuse the people as much as they would like in order to secure their one world government plans. Coleman states on page 42, quote, the Levin Club of Rome plan is designed to demoralize us all so that in the end we feel we should follow whatever it is that is planned for us. We will follow Club of Rome's orders like sheep, unquote. It is my belief, based on my research, that what Col Dr. Coleman is telling us is largely, if not completely, true. I always say that if people would just take the time to read the works of these globalist thinkers, they wouldn't have to wonder whether it's true or not that the elite really think this way. If it's not enough for you to look around at the world and come to the conclusion it's run by very evil people for very evil ends, then I suggest reading the Bertrand Russells, the H.G. Wells, the Miles Copelands, the Henry Kissingers, and this is the big news of Brinsky's, because they tell you in no uncertain terms what your crazy tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist friend has been telling you all along is indeed very true. How many times haven't I heard it said of me, that fellow's paranoid? Yes, I'm glad to admit it.